Keitra, thank you so much for joining our Flux retreat, our virtual session here in November. I'm so happy that you're here, so happy to collaborate with you. I know that you're going to share some really great insights in regards to mental health awareness, and I'll turn it over to you. Right, thank you. So I am Keitra, I'm a native of St. Louis. I have been in the counseling field for whoo, probably 16, close to 17 years, specializing in anxiety disorders, mood disorders, just overall helping my clients to kind of understand the mind-body connection. So this is right up my alley. We're kind of discussing how stress and anxiety and depression play a role in our everyday lives, still allowing certain people to be able to thrive and function and show a certain degree of productivity, even though these symptoms are underlying. So what we're kind of going over today is, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Like, what does it mean if you discover you can thrive in high stress situations, you have functioning anxiety, you have functioning depression. We kind of operate from the one thing that as humans, we all have that is the exact same, and that is our nervous system. So everything kind of stems from our body's response, how we perceive stress, how we respond to it, and then how it has an impact on the way that we show up in the world. So we'll kind of talk about just educational pieces, what those definitions are, what are the very basic understandings of the nervous system that you can walk away with. And then we get into techniques on how do you actually regulate your emotions, even though you've been able to be productive? Um, how do you regulate that? How do you self-soothe? What do you walk away with from this that allows you to facilitate both behavioral and cognitive change, as well as being able to regulate your nervous system, regulate how anxiety shows up in your life, and ultimately how depression shows up. Anxiety is an essential function. You never want to say that you have an anxiety disorder or you're struggling with anxiety and you want to get rid of it completely. It is an essential function. It is what keeps you alive. So you have two separate segments of the nervous system that we'll get into. But what you want to understand is it is as normal as eating and breathing, but it becomes problematic when it's excessive, when you are worrying excessively, when your thoughts are racing, ruminating, or when you notice that you just have these over-exaggerated responses to what would be considered like everyday life stressors. So this is how your nervous system communicates with you to keep you safe. It operates through feeling anxious. That fear is coming from whatever you determine for yourself or you perceive as a threat in your environment. This threat can be real or it can be a perceived threat. Um, your anxiety system does not know the difference between what is real and what is perceived. It just knows one way to operate to kind of keep you alive, keep you safe. So a lot of people these days talk about being triggered by things. And that's kind of what that is. It's very complex. Um, so you can be triggered by a lot of events that have happened in the past and something is happening to you right now in the present moment that is reminding you of that past event and having you kind of not look forward to what a potential future event that's uncomfortable would be that kind of reminds you of that. Um, so what happens is you have two segments to the nervous system. You have the sympathetic, you have the parasympathetic. Whole drawn out complicated process of how the brain works. But the important things to remember are that your sympathetic system is like the gas pedal. Your parasympathetic system is like the brake pedal. So sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. When you are in a threatening situation and the threat is subjective, it looks different from one person to the next, your body uh, immediately kind of goes into what does it take to keep us alive? What does it take to get us away from this threat? So that's where you get kind of either you're going to fight or you're going to flight. There are also separate elements like flee and fawn um, that also present themselves and when we are presented with threats, but mainly we'll talk about like fight or flight to keep it less complicated today. When that happens, certain hormones get released into your body that are simply for your survival. The main one is cortisol. It's the stress hormone. What happens is, say that you are driving down the road, somebody cuts you off, you have milliseconds to kind of make that decision to press the brake to prevent yourself from smashing into this person. 
what your nervous system now begins to do is it prepares you for fight or flight. So I guess pressing the brake can kind of be representative of your fight mode, like you're fighting against hitting or running into the back of this person. Now what happens is your brain kind of decides and it communicates to your nervous system which functions of our senses do we need to maintain that are the most important in this situation to keep us alive. More times than not, probably 99% of the time, your sense of taste is going to be the very first thing to leave. In that moment, you do not need to taste or eat, right, for your survival. What's important is your sense of sight, your sense of sound, and your sense of touch. You need to hear what's around you. You need to see what's around you. You need to feel yourself pressing the brake. You need to feel when the vehicle actually stops in a safe enough distance to where you don't run into the back of the car. What you're not doing is looking around and going, oh, there's a McDonald's. I can really use, you know, a number two right now. Like that's not happening. So sense of taste, sense of smell are probably kind of decreased in that moment. And if you haven't heard before, especially with people who are visually impaired, hearing impaired, when you lose a sense, it heightens the other senses. So your brain is doing this because you need those other senses to be heightened for your survival. When you realize you have reached a safe point, you have barely missed running to the back of this person. One of the things that you probably do is kind of take a deep breath and exhale. But then what's going to happen next to allow your system to reset is you are going to resume being able to produce saliva. That's a function that is completely gone when you're in a dangerous situation. So we kind of get into that a little later on, actually using this to your benefit when the threat is perceived. How do you ground? How do you reset your own nervous system manually? But since if there's a clear, right, this is a real threat. So there's a clear ending point to the threat. Your body does that on its own. It's not something that you manually need to do to kind of prevent that. And this is a threat that is not long-term. It's not drawn out like what functioning anxiety kind of presents itself to be. It's kind of this long drawn out process that can go on indefinitely. Um, there's not something that you're doing to manually stop it. So we talk about cortisone. It's a stress hormone, plays a very big part in your stress response when it gets released from your adrenal glands. So it has a lot of other functions. It regulates your blood sugar, your metabolism. It's responsible for inflammation. So it is a key element in this fight or flight response. And it's like this innate thing that we just have as humans that activates automatically whenever we're in a threatening situation. Um, and this is why we call it the stress hormone. So when you have functioning anxiety, this hormone is constantly high. Um, it's just this chronic stress that you learn to tolerate. Um, it contributes to other mental health problems as well, but this chronic sense of releasing of cortisol can go into adrenal fatigue. Um, you can see like weight gain in your upper body, like it just begins to have all of these other side effects to it when it's just this lasting thing that does not have a cutoff point because there's perceived like our work stressors, financial stressors, family stressors. There is no end point. There is no moment where you really reach in those situations when they're lasting, where you can say, oh, okay, I've kind of reached this safe space. So over time, people who function under high stress and function with their anxiety, they begin to tolerate it. They build up resistance to it um, because these stressors, like I said, are chronic in your everyday life. Um, so this is like the purest form of what we would describe in my field as like functioning anxiety. After a while, it's so chronic, it's so present, it's always there. You learn and kind of condition yourself to be able to tolerate it, push through it, press through it to still get things done. Um, so how do you recognize it in yourself? A lot of what you were recognizing yourself is like this intense sense of worry that is always there. There's always something on your to-do list. There are always things being added to your to-do list, but you feel this intense pressure of never really being able to complete things, even though you are being productive. And there's also this intense sense of worry and dread and your thoughts may race. You may notice like impairments in your sleep. But on the outside, what allows functioning anxiety to exist is that the people around you see you as always being prepared. They see you as stable, you're well-adjusted, you're very successful, you know how to be productive. 
but internally, like these very things are what are paralyzing you. They'll tell you you're very organized. You'll see some traits of perfectionism where you just have to have things a specific way, a specific order, because you always from functioning anxiety have to be prepared. Not being prepared in a situation is something that can completely unravel you. So you may have this very calm exterior to people. They see you getting a lot of things done, but internally, like you're on fire. You can't stop thinking. Just your system is just all out of whack. Um, another, we talked about fight or flight, flee and fawn are also some responses of the nervous system. And fawn is kind of that you're going to do whatever is necessary to avoid conflict. So if you're people pleasing, you're always saying yes, you have trouble setting boundaries and saying no, or you do not understand when you have reached your capacity, you still continue to give and do knowing that like you're running out of resources. So if these symptoms are present, um, then it's time at that point to kind of discuss with somebody if there is something that you need to do to be addressing the anxiety in your life. So functioning depression. And I also joke in my sessions with my clients as well that like depression and anxiety can sometimes be twins. It's just one is more dominant in its presentation than the other one. Um, but you very rarely see somebody who has anxiety that doesn't have some symptoms of depression or has depression and doesn't have some symptoms of anxiety. They kind of present hand in hand. Um, but if you are still getting up and you are still putting on a mask and going to work and taking care of your kids and taking care of family members and meeting other responsibilities. You're trying to be there for your friends, but underneath that, like you have a complete loss of interest in just everyday things that you would normally be engaged in. Sadness, emptiness, hopelessness, or like this long lasting, just feeling of being down, no energy. Trouble concentrating, trouble remembering things, um, difficulty making decisions, or you notice that you're more irritable or angry than you used to be. Um, the appetite one kind of goes, it depends on the person. Some people stress eat, some people don't have an appetite. Just depends on how your nervous system is communicating with you, but you, it's going to go either way. Both represent symptoms of depression if you are overeating or under eating, and then issues with sleep. So depression. Depression is more of a complicated thing because it's a little more difficult to self-regulate than anxiety. Um, anxiety is a little bit easier because all of our nervous systems are the same. They function the same and we can kind of manually kind of manipulate what we need that to look like when it comes to anxiety. But depression um, takes a little bit of work. Like it takes some inner work. It may take having to see a psychiatrist and you know, replace some medications to kind of assist with whatever coping mechanism that you put in place. Um, but you really want to address it when you are understanding that it's starting to impact more than one area of your life. Um, yes, you do good at work, but at home, you know, do you present as a different person? Are you able to function and get things done? And even if you're good at work, you're good at home, you're good at school, but when you're by yourself, you kind of notice that you begin to unravel tearfulness, sad, for, you know, being sad, like this overall sense of dread that you cannot shake. It's at that point that you kind of need to recognize it's a little above you. You may need to call in for some support or some assistance to kind of get to the bottom of what is going on. And then also with depression, you also want to know that it's a mind-body connection. So yes, there are clearly things happening in your brain, with chemicals being released in your brain, but you also want to check for like underlying health um, conditions. You want to check to make sure that you don't have any vitamin deficiencies, especially vitamin D. Uh, research has shown that it's had a strong link with depression when those levels are really low. So what you want to do is do whole health, whole mind health, mind, body, soul. When you're wanting to treat depression, you need a goal for your mind, a goal for your body, a goal for your soul, because you can make sure that all of those areas are being depressed, I mean, being um, addressed. So, so in a, the clinical field, when we are looking at people, there is major depressive disorder that is definitely more chronic, but then functioning depression typically gets diagnosed as what we call persistent depressive disorder. So it's a milder form of major depression, but the clinical symptoms kind of still present themselves the same. And it does require like just whole health, like we just talked about, talk therapy, which is psychotherapy, and then potentially medication management in order for you to see the effects and see that like the lasting outcome so that you want to see. So they're not as continuous. 
stay a little more short-lived, which is the main difference, but everything else will kind of present itself the same. So it's finding a clinician, finding a doctor that's kind of willing to sit down with you, go over your history, get some really detailed information to kind of help you narrow down what you're actually dealing with so that they can, you know, coordinate the treatment plan. When you think about functioning anxiety and kind of being in this constant straight of state of stress, there are ways that you can self-soothe. There are ways that you can reset your nervous system, to kind of get you from that fight or flight mode to operating out of your parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest. Um, a lot of people do this in a very maladaptive way because you kind of get the same results. Um, a lot of people self-soothe with going shopping, so getting on Amazon or various apps and just kind of ordering things, emotional eating and substance abuse. So we're kind of discuss how do you self-soothe in ways that are actually serving you and productive and not kind of leading to creating and making the problems more worse than what they started off. With. We'll talk about grounding. It's important to ground with all five of your senses. Um, and I'll give you a variety of different examples of things that you can do. But the one thing to walk away with remembering whenever you need to ground is that you always want to start with your sense of taste very important to start with that sense because it is the first sense that you lose. So when you have a real or perceived threat, you'll notice your mouth starts to get dry, you stop producing saliva, you lose your appetite because your brain kind of automatically determines for you, right, to shut that sense off. You do not need that in that moment that it's perceiving to be dangerous to survive. So the moment that you activate your sense of taste first and you kind of force yourself to begin to taste, produce saliva, what that is communicating to your brain is, are we really in danger if we can produce saliva? There's, it would be impossible for us to actually be able to produce saliva in a threatening situation. So what is actually happening? You can do that with herbal teas, with healthy snacks, like keeping things on hand. The next sense that you may want to go to is your sense of smell. So you can use essential oils, you can use body lotions, you can use scented candles, just anything that's your favorite scent. Um, and then we move through what the other senses would be in that system, right? Making sure that you hit all five because it helps to kind of shift you from that zone of being anxious and depressed and it regulates your mood. So general rule of thumb is to start with sense of taste. You want to find in your area one thing you can taste, two things you can smell, three things you can hear, four things you can touch, and five things that you can see. And when you cycle through this, what you will begin to notice is that you can feel your system beginning to self-regulate. So your breathing begins to normalize. You have a renewed sense of being able to produce saliva, which is already calming. Your heartbeat will begin to decrease. A general rule of thumb is if you do feel like you suffer more than two or three days out of the week with this intense sense of panic or anxiety, is to kind of make a little grounding kit for yourself. So you may want to get like a little bag or a little box or like a makeup pouch. Put these items there. So you may want to have hard candy or like a little bottle of essential oils or maybe some cotton balls that you can feel, something that makes noise and something that's colorful. So in that moment, you can kind of go to this bag where you don't have to put too much thought into gathering things for you to ground with. They're already there, already accessible. You just kind and of pull begin them to out. ground with those things in those moments so that they can be helpful for you with just calming and regulating your nervous system. When you get done working through all five senses, you will notice you will shift from fight or flight to rest and digest and your body will begin to calm down. So some additional resources, some additional coping mechanisms and strategies to use for emotional regulation, um, yoga and meditation. You can use mindfulness, healthy eating habits and exercise. And that exercise can look like anything except high intensity. The issue with high intensity is that it releases cortisol in your system. So if you're working out and it's strenuous, you're kind of sending the wrong message to your body at that time. So this would look like walking, pacing, maybe even stretching um, just to get some movement. Prioritizing rest is very important. This doesn't necessarily mean sleep, but rest 
you know, are there moments where you have stillness, even if you can only grab two to five minutes of just completely being still, allowing your mind to be at ease, you know, reminding yourself, yes, you have things to do. Yes, you do have things to worry about. But for these five minutes, you're just kind of going to sit in solitude, gather yourself, reset. Um, another one is setting boundaries. It is very important to understand what are the guidelines, what are the parameters that you have in your life solely for the purpose of keeping you safe from being overwhelmed or from being under-resourced. So going forward, you have to look and assess if I am feeling overwhelmed or I am feeling under-resourced, I don't have enough support, I don't have enough resources. That means that a boundary needs to be set either with yourself or with the people around you. Journaling is very good. A lot of people are not really big on journaling, but it helps to, when you have racing thoughts, to get those thoughts out of your head and onto paper. Um, I usually recommend people who have racing thoughts, especially at night when they suffer from anxiety, is to keep like a blank sheet of paper next to your bed where you can brain dump. Like what are these random racing thoughts that just keep circling in your head once you get them down on paper, it allows for you to rest because your brain is not feeling like you really, really have to remember this information. You're sure you have it down. Your thoughts can stop racing. You can kind of revisit it the next morning and see, you know, out of all that, what's an actual priority or what is something that you can add on your to-do list for that day. Therapy is very beneficial. Being patient with therapy. Um, it's kind of like any other profession you try. If you don't feel like the therapist is a good fit, get another one. Our feelings will not be hurt. You know, there are different styles, different backgrounds, the, different like theoretical basis. So just because one therapist doesn't work out for you doesn't mean that it's the end all be all and therapy just doesn't work for you. You know, go out there and try to find what a good fit is for you. And a lot of therapists will offer like a 10 to 15 minute consultation that's free of charge where you can reach out to them before you ever schedule an appointment just to see if you get a feel for how they operate their practice, what kind of therapeutic techniques they use, what kind of person they are you know, before you ever start. Acupuncture is another one that is really good for emotional regulation, for kind of helping to minimize cortisol levels, to give you that relaxed response. So if you have access to that in your area, it's something to look into. Um, and building a support system of people who actually know how to support you, who are willing to listen to you and try to be as, you know, not as judgmental, um, but just people that you can turn to and talk to. That you can um, but I would say, to. see what you can do with the mind-body connection first, and then making sure there are no underlying like medical issues that are the foundation for the symptoms. Um, and medication really does like 50% of the work. So you get on something that kind of helps with regulating depression, regulating anxiety, but then there's this whole other 50% that you still need to be contributing on your own so that you can have like 100% efficacy. So I also recommend coming up with a playlist specifically for when you're anxious or when you're depressed or when you're feeling stressed that you can go to and listen to this soothing. If you have hobbies, if you have arts, crafts, or whatever that looks like, spending time outdoors and getting sunshine, because um, like I said, vitamin D does play a very important role um, in how we present with symptoms of depression. Um, I hope that you all found this information useful, that you can have some takeaways to walk away with, some suggestions that you can implement into your everyday life if you feel like you kind of fall under these categories of just kind of going through life in autopilot, managing these symptoms of depression, managing these symptoms of anxiety and still having to function. Uh, again, so how, if people have additional questions, how can they get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me via phone. My, I am uh, licensed in the state of Texas. Um, so I provide information and services for people in Texas. Yeah. But people out of state, if it's not technically therapy and they just kind of have questions or concerns or want some suggestions, they can definitely call me, 214-991-4000, uh, or my website, www.lotusblossomcounseling plc.com i am also on instagram as lotus blossom plc Keetra young ariel thank you so much again for collaborating with arfa lux and you guys reach out to her